My name is Lily, and I work as an editor at a big publishing company in the city. I'm just an ordinary girl who likes to keep things simple. Life has always been busy for me, trying to meet deadlines while also finding some time for myself. Maybe that's why I never really got into dating. I usually enjoyed spending time alone, whether it was with a good book or taking a quiet walk in the park near my apartment. But everything changed on one sunny Sunday that seemed like any other. I was deep into a podcast, walking along without a care in the world. The park was full of people, kids running around, and pets playing. I must have lost track of where I was walking because the next thing I knew, a guy on a bicycle almost ran into me. Watch out, he shouted, swerving at the last second. His voice was sharp, and I could tell he was annoyed. I'm so sorry, I said quickly, taking out one of my earbuds. I hadn't realized I had wandered onto the bike path. He stopped his bike and turned around, now looking more amused than angry. You've got to watch where you're going. This path can be a jungle sometimes. Yeah, my bad. Totally my fault, I admitted, feeling a bit embarrassed. I brushed a stray strand of hair from my face and gave him a shy smile. He laughed, and just like that, the tension was gone. I'm Jerry, he said, extending his hand. Lily, I replied, shaking his hand. His handshake was firm and confident. So, Lily, are you always this distracted, or is it just my charming presence? He said with a playful grin that made me laugh. Just a long week at work. My brain is already on weekend mode, I said. Fair enough. I was just about to grab a coffee at that cafe over there. He pointed to a small place at the edge of the park. Care to join me? You know, as a peace offering for almost running me over. I thought about it for a moment. He seemed nice, and honestly, I was curious. Sure, I could use a coffee. Why not? It might even make for a good story, I said as we walked to the cafe. Jerry was easy to talk to. He told me about his job at a car sales company and how he liked to spend his weekends biking or hanging out with friends. He wasn't from the city he moved here because he thought it offered more opportunities. You know, big city dreams and all that, he said with a smirk. I shared a bit about my job too, explaining how I loved books and turned that passion into a career. It's better than being stuck in a cubicle doing something you hate, I added. We reached the cafe and ordered our coffees. While we waited, I realized how comfortable I felt around him. It was strange because I'm usually a bit reserved around new people. But with Jerry, the conversation just flowed. After meeting Jerry, we started hanging out more. He was funny and easygoing, but it wasn't long before I started noticing little things that bothered me. At first, it was nothing major just small comments here and there that made me raise an eyebrow. One Sunday, we decided to go out for dinner and somehow the topic of careers and family came up. We were just chatting about work and life, nothing serious or so I thought. So how's the book world treating you? Jerry asked, taking a sip of his beer. It's busy as always. Deadlines don't stop for anyone, I replied, poking at my salad. Yeah, I get that, but you wouldn't want to be stuck in that forever, right? I mean, eventually you'd want to settle down, Maybe cut back on work hours, Jerry said casually. I paused, my fork midair. Not really, Jerry. I love what I do. I don't see myself giving it up anytime soon, or ever really. Jerry shrugged. Sure, but what about when we have kids? Wouldn't you want to be around more? The question caught me off guard. Weave, I chuckled nervously. That's jumping way ahead, don't you think? He laughed it off. Yeah, you're right. Just thinking out loud, I guess. I tried to shake off the discomfort, but it lingered. A couple of weeks later, Jerry invited me to have dinner with his parents. I figured it was a good sign thing getting serious and all. I was nervous but hopeful. That dinner, though, opened my eyes a bit more. His parents lived in a cozy, well-kept house in the suburbs. His mom, Mrs. David, was all smiles when we arrived. Lily, so lovely to finally meet you. Jerry has told us so much about you, she gushed, 
pulling me into a hug. Thank you for having me, Mrs. David. It's great to meet you too, I replied. I managed to reply with a smile. Dinner was going well until Mrs. Davids started talking about family and marriage. You know, Jerry was always the responsible one, she said, serving herself more potatoes. We've always told him how important it is to find a good girl who knows how to take care of a home. Jerry's dad nodded in agreement. Absolutely, it's about building a strong foundation. A man needs to provide, and a woman, well, she takes care of the home. I glanced at Jerry, hoping he'd say something, but he just focused on his food. Mrs. David continued, that's how we raised our boys. Family first, right, Jerry? Right, Mom, Jerry finally said, looking up. His agreement felt like a punch to the gut. I tried to stay calm. It's interesting because I've always been very focused on my career. I love my job and believe in contributing equally. Mrs. David smiled, but it felt forced. Of course, dear, but you'll see, priorities change when you have children. It's only natural for a woman to want to stay at home with her babies. The rest of the evening passed in a blur. We left shortly after dinner, and the drive home was tense. I broke the silence. Your mom has some strong opinions about family roles. Do you feel the same way? He hesitated, then said, I think there's some truth to it. It worked for my parents. Despite the uneasy dinner with Jerry's parents, our relationship continued. Somehow, the good times seemed to outweigh the bad, and I found myself agreeing to marry him. Looking back, Love must have blinded me because those warning signs were still there in the back of my mind. The wedding planning began, and it was all a whirlwind. Jerry wanted something simple, and so did I. We decided on a modest ceremony with just close family and friends. As the day approached, the real pressure started to build not about the event, but about what our lives would be like afterward. After the ceremony at the reception, Jerry's mom pulled me aside. Her smile was wide, but her eyes were serious. Lily, dear, I'm so happy for you both. Remember, a good wife supports her husband no matter what. Thank you, Mrs. David. I intend to be a supportive partner, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. And remember, dear, when the babies start coming, it's best if you're at home. You can't trust strangers to raise your children, she added. Her words felt like a warning and the finality in her tone made my stomach churn. I just nodded, not trusting myself to speak. Later, when Jerry and I were alone, I said, Your mom talked to me about kids and me not working. I started watching his reaction closely. Yeah, she's just looking out for the future. She means, well, Lily, you know how moms are. Jerry brushed it off, taking a sip of his champagne. But you know I'm not planning to quit my job, right? Even when we have kids, I said, needing him to understand. Jerry paused, his face serious. We'll see, Lily. things change. We'll do what's best for our family. After our wedding, Jerry suggested we move to a larger apartment closer to his work at the car sales company. The place was nice, bigger than our old one, but it was right next door to his parents' house. I had my doubts about why he chose this particular spot, but I agreed hoping for the best. Once we settled in, the reality of our new life together began to show. Jerry started bringing up his idea of a traditional family more often where he would be the breadwinner, and I would handle the household and, eventually, the kids. One evening, we sat down with our finances spread across the dining table, a mess of bills and budgets under the dim light. I tried to show him how keeping both our jobs was better especially with the economy being unstable. Look at these numbers, Jerry. With both incomes, we're not just getting by, we're actually saving. It doesn't make sense for me to quit my job, I said, pointing at the spreadsheet. Jerry shook his head, pushing the papers away slightly. It's not just about the money, Lily. It's about having a real family life, you know, like my parents had. I sighed, feeling frustrated. But it's not the past, Jerry. Things are different now. We both need to contribute. He didn't seem convinced, and the discussion ended with a heavy silence. 
The situation got more complicated with his mother, Mrs. David, living so close. She dropped by often, unannounced, each visit with a new critique about how I was managing our home. One afternoon, I was sorting through some work emails when she came in without a greeting. She started inspecting the house, wiping her finger along the bookshelf, looking for dust. Lily, you really should focus more on keeping a cleaner house. A dusty home is not a healthy home, she said, her tone sharp. I clenched my teeth, trying to stay calm. I cleaned yesterday, Mrs. David, and I work full time. It's just a little dust. That's just it you work too much. If you were home more, maybe things wouldn't slip through, she countered, walking over to the linen closet. She pulled out a sheet, checking for any signs of improper laundering. I followed her, my hands clenched into fists at my sides, trying to keep my cool. I manage my time just fine, Mrs. David. Jerry and I are both happy with how things are, I said. She shook her head and moved to the kitchen to check the contents of our fridge. A woman's place is taking care of her home and husband. All these modern ideas about women needing careers are nonsense. Every comment stung, and I felt my defenses rising. Maybe that worked for you, but I'm not you. I'm not going to quit my job and become someone I'm not. When Jerry came home that evening, I tried to explain how suffocating his mother's visits were becoming. He listened, but his response chilled me. Mom's just trying to help Lily. She has a lot of experience running a home. But it's our home, not hers. I need you to stand up for me for us, I pleaded. Jerry looked torn but finally said, She's my mom, Lily. She means well. We should at least consider her advice. The argument that night was long and painful. We went to bed angry, the first of many silent nights. As the days turned into weeks, I felt more like an outsider in my own home, constantly judged and found wanting. The pressure to conform to an outdated idea of a wife was relentless, and my resolve to maintain my independence was tested every day. As the months passed, Jerry's complaints about me not doing enough at home started to increase. He would come home from work, look around with a scowl and comment on the dusty shelves or the dinner that was either too bland or overcooked because I had rushed it after a long day at the publishing house. His favorite phrase became, if you can't manage both, maybe you shouldn't be working. One evening, after a particularly harsh critique of some slightly undercooked pasta, Jerry let it drop. Lily, I'm serious. If you can't meet me halfway and take care of the house properly, Maybe we should rethink this whole arrangement, he said, implying that a divorce was on the table. I love Jerry despite everything, and I didn't want our marriage to fail over this, so I made a decision that pained me deeply. The next day, I talked to my boss, Olivia, about quitting my job to become a full-time housewife. Olivia was shocked and tried to persuade me otherwise. Lily, you're one of our best. Are you sure about this? she asked concern clear on her face. I don't see any other way, Olivia. I have to try to make things work at home, I replied. I admitted feeling defeated. Olivia, always trying to find a solution, suggested a compromise. What if you could work from home and manage your projects remotely? It's becoming more common now, and you wouldn't have to quit. The idea felt like a lifeline. I agreed to the arrangement but decided not to tell Jerry. Instead, I told him I had resigned. He was overjoyed, thinking I had chosen our home life over my career. So I started my new life as a housewife, seeing Jerry off to work each morning and greeting him when he came home. But as soon as he left, I would power up my laptop and dive into my editing work. It was a strange double life, but it worked. The money I earned from my remote job, I secretly saved in a separate bank account, just in case. However, living on just Jerry's salary was tougher than we thought. Despite my best efforts to save money, five months later, we were struggling financially. I tried to bring up the topic gently. Jerry, I think it might be necessary for me to go back to work. We're running through our savings too fast. Jerry's reaction was swift and angry. 
That's because you're spending too much. You need to learn how to save properly, he snapped. I was stunned. I hadn't bought anything for myself in months and always looked for the cheapest deals at the supermarket. His words hurt deeply, and I felt a mix of anger and humiliation. The next day, his mother came over with the intention of teaching me how to budget. She dragged me to the store and pointed out the cheapest, often lowest quality products. Buy these, Lily. Stop wasting money on expensive stuff, she lectured as we walked down the aisles. Back home, she showed me how to dilute dish soap to make it last longer. You use too much. You need to make do with less, she instructed in a patronizing tone. She even started checking my receipts, scolding me for any purchase she deemed unnecessary. Why are you buying this? Just stick to basics, she would say, shaking her head in disapproval. Living like this was unbearable. Every day felt more suffocating than the last. I was losing my sense of self to their imposed austerity, living under constant scrutiny. The situation was becoming impossible to bear. I felt trapped in a life of pretend submission, with every part of me screaming for escape. But for now, I held on, biding my time and planning my next steps carefully. It all reached a boiling point one drizzly Friday evening. I was on the phone in the living room, pouring my heart out to my mom. I just don't know how much more I can take, mom. His mother is always here, teaching me how to stretch every dollar until it screams. I get it, we need to save, but this is too much. Mom's voice was full of concern and anger. Lily, that's not normal. You need to talk to Jerry about setting boundaries. It's your home too, not just his or his mother's playground. I nodded, feeling a bit stronger with my mom's support. But just as I was starting to feel better, Jerry stormed in from the other room, his face red with anger. He must have heard me complaining. He snatched the phone right out of my hand. A wife shouldn't be complaining about her husband and mother-in-law like some street gossip. He snapped into the phone before hanging up. I was shocked, my hand shaking slightly. Jerry, you can't just grab my phone and talk to my mom like that. Oh, I can't? Maybe if you had some respect for us, I wouldn't have to, he retorted, his voice rising. I could see the veins in his neck bulging. Jerry, listen to yourself. Can't you see this isn't healthy? I pleaded, hoping to reach some part of him that remembered what love felt like, but he was beyond reason. Healthy? My mom was right. I should never have married you, he spat out, his words cutting deeper than I expected. That's enough, Jerry. I'm your wife, not some puppet you and your mom can control. I shot back, my anger flaring. Then act like it, or leave, he shouted, his face inches from mine. I stared at him, disbelief and sadness warring inside me. You want me to leave at 6 a.m.? It's dark and pouring rain outside. If you don't like how things are, then yes, get out, he replied coldly, his eyes unyielding. I knew then that nothing I could say would change his mind or the situation. Shaking, I grabbed a few essentials my laptop, some clothes and my phone. When I reached for my purse, Jerry was quicker, snatching it away. You think you're leaving with this? I earned this money, not you. Fine, keep it, I said, my voice hollow. I couldn't believe this was happening. I called a taxi and waited by the door, my heart pounding. The taxi pulled up and I stepped out into the cold night air, drenched by the rain. As I climbed into the car, a strange calm settled over me. I was doing this. I was leaving. Later at the hotel, as I lay in the unfamiliar bed, I felt a mix of emotions. I felt a wave of relief amidst all the chaos. Despite everything, I hadn't quit my job, and my secret savings account, which Jerry didn't know about, was now my lifeline. As dawn broke, I got up, the weight of my decision heavy on my mind. Today was the day I would take control back. I had an appointment with a lawyer to talk about filing for divorce. It felt surreal, like I was living someone else's life. The lawyer's office was a simple, unremarkable place, tucked between a row of old brick buildings. Inside Mr. Richard, my lawyer, was a straightforward man who didn't waste any time. 
Let's get down to business, he said as soon as I sat down. You're here to file for divorce, correct? Yes, I confirmed, my voice steadier than I expected. I can't go back to the way things were. Mr. Richard nodded seriously. All right. I'll need all the details, any joint accounts, property, anything that needs untangling. We spent the next hour going over everything. He explained the legal process, what I could expect, and what my rights were. He was thorough, making sure I understood each step before preparing the necessary documents. You'll need to serve these to your husband, he instructed as he handed me the envelope, sealed with a stamp that felt like the seal on my old life. With the divorce papers in hand, I went back to the apartment I had shared with Jerry. He was still asleep, probably exhausted from last night's argument. The apartment felt different as I packed my things each item. I put away marked the end of another shared chapter. By the time I finished packing, Jerry was waking up. He wandered into the kitchen, bleary-eyed and clearly confused to see my bags piled by the door. What's going on? He mumbled, scratching his head. I didn't have much to say, just actions to take. Instead of answering, I handed him the envelope. These are for you, I said, my voice calm despite the emotions swirling inside. Jerry tore open the envelope, a frown forming as he read the contents. Divorce, he laughed, disbelief in his tone. You think you can just walk out and everything will be all right? He looked up from the papers, his eyes cold. Come back when you're ready to apologize, and maybe I'll consider taking you back. But remember, you'll have to listen to my mother from now on. The absurdity of his words almost made me laugh, but I held it back. I'm not coming back, Jerry. We're done. As I walked out of that apartment, the air felt different crisper, almost hopeful. I went straight to the new place I had rented just days before. It was small, but it was mine, a space where I could start fresh. Every step I took felt heavy, but it also felt right. A few weeks after moving in, I was back at the office, fully diving into the whirlwind of publishing deadlines and meetings with authors. Being around my colleagues again and feeling the familiar rush of an approaching deadline reignited a spark in me that I thought I had lost. Days at the office blended into weeks, and before I knew it, I was back in my groove, managing manuscripts and deadlines with a new sense of purpose. The challenges I had faced in my personal life had given me a fresh perspective, and it felt really good to be back. The familiar world of texts and typos was more comforting than I had imagined. During this time, I reconnected with old friends people who knew me long before Jerry. We met for drinks after work and shared meals on weekends. Slowly, I started to feel more like myself than I had in years. The laughter and lighthearted teasing grounded me, and in their company, I rediscovered parts of myself I had forgotten. A few months into this new phase, I received an unexpected call from Jerry. His voice was awkward and tinged with desperation. Hey, oh, I got laid off. Things are pretty rough, he started, stumbling over his words. I was thinking maybe you could help me out financially. And, you know, maybe we could start over rebuild. I mean, if you apologize to me and my mom and show some commitment. His request hung in the air, audacious and somewhat insulting given our history. Jerry, you really think I'd come back to support you and your parents after you kicked me out? You're out of a job now, and suddenly all your high and mighty principles are gone. There was a pause. So that's a no, he asked, sounding smaller and deflated. Jerry, I'm doing really well. And honestly, I'm enjoying my freedom too much to give it up again. I hope you find your way, but it won't be with me. My words were firm, sealing the end of our relationship. After hanging up, I felt a surge of empowerment. Jerry's call, though ridiculous, had reaffirmed something important for me. I was truly free now, and no offer or plea was going to change that. Hello, Amy. Please come to Isa Restaurant across from the station right away. The whole family is here waiting for you. Isa Restaurant? You mean that French restaurant place? What do you mean the whole family is waiting? Actually, I reserved the place. 
I even invited the family members who usually can't make it. The cost will be around $20,000, and I'll be paying with your credit card. Please hurry. With that, my husband James hung up the phone. Am I paying $20,000? That's ridiculous. I just stood there in disbelief, but honestly, I wasn't surprised. I was just shocked by how foolish my husband was. He really doesn't get it. Despite having everything under control, my husband is putting himself in a terrible situation, and I'm seriously thinking about pushing him over the edge. With that thought, I left the house. Twenty minutes later, I arrived at Isa restaurant. James was waiting alone and greeted me with a creepy smile that didn't match the fancy restaurant. He said the relatives were already in another room, and he started talking proudly. Amy, like I said earlier, I'm going to use your credit card freely. It may seem tough, but a wife's money belongs to her husband. It's only natural for a wife to support her husband, right? You don't have any complaints, do you? I was speechless. This was unbelievable foolishness. According to James, 25 relatives had gathered, and he had booked an expensive meal that cost $800 per person. Isa Restaurant is indeed a French restaurant place known for offering high-quality meals at reasonable prices, but my husband purposely chose the most expensive $800 option. It's like he enjoys making his wife suffer, completely unaware of the mess he's getting himself into. James seemed pretty pleased with himself in this ridiculous situation, and all I could do was laugh. A wife's wallet belongs to her husband? It's natural for a wife to support her husband? Well, you know, I stopped that a month ago. What? You stopped being a wife? You can't just quit like that. Divorce requires formal procedures, you know that, right? James, you don't understand anything. If you did, you wouldn't have reserved such an expensive place. How do you plan to pay without money? Are you planning to dine and dash? I would never do something so foolish. Let me say it again, I'm going to pay with your credit card. If you don't like it, I'll really make you stop being my wife. Right after he said that, I pulled out a document and shoved it in front of him, showing just how clueless he was. I canceled the credit card a month ago. Here's the cancellation certificate. I brought it because I knew you wouldn't believe me. The card is useless now, so I'll ask again with no money. What are you going to do? Are you planning to run away? What? I can't use your credit card. That's impossible. That cancellation certificate must be fake. After all, the credit card I took was from your purse. If it was really canceled, why would you keep it in your purse? So you're not even hiding that you took it from my purse. I left the canceled card in there because I thought you might try to steal it. You were completely tricked. Poor thing. Amy, what's with that attitude? It's not acceptable for a wife to speak to her husband like that. James thinks he's better than me, so being outsmarted by someone he sees as beneath him must be unbearable. His frustration peaked, and he started raising his voice without caring who heard him. Even though we were in a corner of the restaurant, his voice carried, and the staff began to notice. The place started to buzz with whispers. Looking around, James quickly forced a smile and tried to calm things down, acting like everything was fine but the whispers didn't stop. James's face turned red with embarrassment, but compared to what was coming, this was nothing. Soon after, my in-laws came over to me. It seems James's loud voice had reached the relatives as well. James, what are you doing? The relatives are all shocked. You're disturbing other guests too. Look, everyone is watching. I just got a little excited. It's nothing serious, so don't worry. It seemed my in-laws hadn't caught the details of our conversation and looked confused, but they didn't say anything more. James was smiling slightly, trying to smooth things over, but he was probably relieved inside that his parents-in-law had shown up. He only shows his true self to me, especially since he works for the company his father runs. In front of him, James always pretends to be the perfect husband. I also looked shocked, just like my in-laws, but James gave me a stern look and silently warned me. Don't say anything unnecessary. I won't forgive you if you do. 
I could feel the pressure from him. He has always tried to scare me and control me with force. I used to be afraid and would do what he wanted, but this time, I couldn't take it anymore. James inviting the relatives turned out to be the perfect chance to show everyone his true colors. I started talking to my in-laws about who was going to pay the bill. James planned to use my credit card, I explained. He took the card for my purse and reserved this restaurant without asking me. My in-laws were shocked. That credit card was actually canceled a month ago, but James doesn't know that and was planning to use it anyway. He doesn't have any money, so how does he plan to pay? Wait a minute, Amy, they said, confused. Are you saying James took your card and planned to pay for today's meal with it? James said he would cover the cost, which is about $20,000. But if what you're saying is true, was he really planning to make you pay $20,000? That's hard to believe. Could this be a misunderstanding? My in-laws were clearly upset, which is the usual reaction. Even though it sounds unbelievable, it's the truth. Trying to hide what was really happening, James started talking in a cheerful tone with a forced smile. Amy is mistaken. I plan to treat everyone at my own expense. I'll settle the bill, so don't worry. With those words, James walked over to the cashier to pay, throwing a creepy smile my way. It was obvious he didn't believe that I had really canceled the credit card, even after I showed him the cancellation certificate. After a while, James returned with a smile, and my in-laws seemed relieved that the payment had been taken care of. But I could sense James's tension. He must have been panicking inside, realizing that things were going wrong because the credit card didn't work. That was no surprise, since I had definitely canceled it. The only option left for him was to pay the $20,000 himself, but he couldn't do that. I also knew what he was hiding in that moment. I gave him a cold stare and said, tell the truth before things get worse. My words made him nervous, and his face changed. After thinking for a moment, he finally admitted the truth. Sorry, Dad, Mom, I really couldn't make the payment. Amy's credit card was actually canceled. Is that true? Were you planning to use Amy's card to pay? His parents asked. It's a misunderstanding, he tried to explain. It's true I intended to pay today's expenses with Amy's credit card, and I had discussed this with her. I was just shocked to find out the card was already canceled. I apologize, but I'll have to ask for help to cover this myself. I promise I'll repay you. He was mixing lies with the truth, trying to find a way out of the situation with surprising boldness. Then he leaned over and whispered to me, Why did you cancel the credit card? Are you trying to embarrass me? Why? It's simple. I didn't want you to use it without my permission, I replied firmly. The real issue isn't the embarrassment. It's the fact that you are using the card without my consent. He looked at me, surprised by my bold response, and quickly said, Be quiet. Don't talk about this here. Keeping a canceled card in your purse just causes confusion. But it seemed my in-laws had overheard our conversation, and they turned to James with a stern look. James, what are you doing? You tried to use Amy's card. Taking it from her purse without permission is unacceptable. Oh, well, there were reasons James stammered, struggling to find the right words when his father pressed him. Sensing the opportunity, I decided to explain everything in detail, wanting to reveal his true nature to his parents. For the past year, James has barely been home. At first, I thought it was because he was busy with work since your company is quite large, father-in-law. But then, James started going out even on holidays and missing important dates like my birthday and our anniversary. On top of that, he began paying more attention to his appearance and started using my credit card without my permission. My in-laws exchanged worried looks, clearly sensing something was very wrong. I asked James if we could spend more time together as a couple and if he could stop using the credit card without asking me first but he argued that it's natural for a wife to support her husband and didn't listen. Worse, he even threatened me with divorce and showed me a divorce form he had already signed. 
Divorce? My father-in-law exclaimed in surprise. Have you been making Amy suffer this much? My mother-in-law asked, raising her voice. My father-in-law stared sternly at his son, realizing that his belief in James being an ideal husband was shattered. There was still hope that James would admit his mistakes, but instead, he tried to defend himself. No, that's not it. What Amy is saying isn't true. I need to look after my appearance because I'm preparing to take over as president. The meetings I attend on weekends are networking events and seminars, all part of my job. What's wrong with using joint funds for work-related expenses? If I stop earning, my wife would suffer too, James said, trying desperately to justify his actions. My in-laws stayed quiet, perhaps finding some logic in James' explanation and hesitating to criticize him. However, I knew the truth and his excuses didn't matter. Oh, really? Can you still say it's part of your job after seeing this? I said, deciding to show more evidence to my in-laws. From my handbag, I pulled out a document that listed dates, store names, and amounts spent. What is this? They asked. This is a credit card statement. As you can see, it shows purchases of luxury items for women. Why would you buy things like that? I asked, holding up the document. James quickly tried to grab it from me but I moved his hand away and looked at him, demanding answers. Why did you buy luxury items for women with my credit card? Cosmetics and jewelry aren't needed for your job, are they? Can you explain this? Uh, those were gifts for the women at work, for their birthdays. It's important to be liked by women in business, you know. The expense was necessary, James said, sounding unsure. His explanation was confusing but considering his position at work, there might have been some truth to it. Saying it was for birthday gifts might seem reasonable, but this time, his parents didn't believe him. Whatever the reason, the fact remains you used Amy's card without permission. If it was really necessary, you should have talked it over with her. Buying luxury brands just because female colleagues asked for them doesn't seem believable. I'm sorry. I apologize for using my wife's card, James finally admitted. I promise I'll never do it again. Please forgive me, my husband pleaded, making an apologetic gesture toward me and his parents. However, my father-in-law's anger didn't fade easily. He sternly warned my husband, just because you're married doesn't mean you can use someone else's credit card without permission. And since the amount is significant, make sure to pay Amy back for the money you spent. All right, I'll refund the money, my husband said, looking downcast and appearing thoughtful, but I wasn't convinced. Did he really think I didn't know he was still hiding something? This was just the beginning of the real challenge. My husband, his parents, and I headed to the room where the other relatives were waiting. Once there, I took out my smartphone from my bag and pressed the play button. The sudden sound surprised my husband, and he stared at me in disbelief, his face quickly turning pale. The audio was a conversation between him and a woman where he was insulting me, and the woman was saying, hurry up and divorce your wife. The family members around us were shocked by what they heard. James, who is this woman? I asked. Oh, well, um, my husband desperately searched for an excuse. His parents glared at him angrily, and the relatives were horrified by the situation. My husband was now facing another crisis right after the credit card issue, without a moment to recover. There's no hiding it anymore. You're having an affair, weren't you? I said firmly. My husband started sweating and quickly shouted, That's not true. I'm not having an affair. It was wrong of me to speak badly about you, but she's just a friend, and we were just hanging out. By the way, when did you record this? Eavesdropping is illegal. Although he admitted to insulting me, he kept denying the affair and tried to shift the focus onto me, blaming me for recording the conversation. But I wasn't backing down. I explained the facts so he couldn't escape. James, I've been keeping an eye on you for a while. The credit card history made the affair obvious. That's why, while you pretended to go to work, I installed a listening device in your car. A listening device in the car? 
That's ridiculous. As I said earlier, eavesdropping is illegal. Do you understand that? If it's to gather evidence of infidelity, it's not illegal as long as it's not used for stalking or anything similar. I responded firmly, showing that I wasn't going to back down. I was ready to do whatever it took to uncover the truth, focusing on my own well-being and finding justice in our troubled relationship. My husband fell silent, realizing he couldn't justify his actions, but he still couldn't admit the truth. Instead, he turned to his parents and relatives, saying, Everyone, please don't believe what she's saying. She's trying to trap me. I haven't been unfaithful. Sighing, I tossed a document in front of him and the relatives. What is this? He asked, looking uneasy. What do you think it is? It's a demand for compensation. As soon as I said that, my husband's face turned pale. The document was a compensation claim I had sent to his mistress. Through an investigation, it was confirmed that he was having an affair with a woman named Lily. So I went to Lily and demanded compensation from her before coming to him. You met Lily directly and demanded compensation? What were you thinking? My husband was so shocked he couldn't speak. But really, he had no right to blame me while ignoring his own mistakes. Surprised? But she told me everything. She didn't hide your wrongdoings. You were buying luxury items for her with my credit card, weren't you? The excuse about gifts for female employees was obviously a lie, it was all for her. Lily admitted everything, and because of my credit card, she agreed to pay compensation. That's why I brought this compensation claim. My husband looked up at the sky, his face full of despair. I waved the compensation claim in front of him, showing it off. Unable to hide his irritation, he raised his voice, saying, Damn, to think you planned all this without me knowing. You're truly a cunning wife. I was your wife, but that's in the past. I told you a month ago that I quit, didn't you hear? In fact, the divorce papers have already been submitted. I'm just an acquaintance now. Did you really submit the divorce papers? Why are you surprised? I simply submitted the divorce papers you waved in my face to try to trouble me. Everything was done through the proper procedures. Any complaints? But you shouldn't just file for divorce on your own. Divorcing without discussion is unreasonable. It might be unreasonable, but that doesn't change the fact that you used my credit card without permission. That's why I filed the divorce papers on my own. This matter is now settled. My husband was left speechless, clearly shocked by my actions. He hadn't expected any of this. My in-laws and other relatives, who were watching, seemed to finally realize that my story was true. Using Amy's credit card without permission and having an affair. To think we believed you two were happily married, and you were committing such betrayals, they said, their faces filled with anger. The entire family sternly reprimanded my husband. My father-in-law spoke firmly. This marks the end of our relationship as parent and child. Additionally, you are fired from the company. Fired? Just for an affair. This is too harsh. Think about it calmly, my husband protested. At that moment, a sharp snap echoed through the room. My mother-in-law had slapped my husband hard across the cheek. Tears filled her eyes, a mix of sadness, pity, and disappointment. Just an affair? You're the one who's wrong, James. You plan to hurt Amy and then just run away? Her voice was filled with anger, and my husband had nothing to say in response. All eyes in the room stared coldly at him. Mere an affair, he had said, revealing his irresponsibility. He had always proclaimed, my wife's money is mine. A wife should devote herself to her husband. Such selfish attitudes were unforgivable. For a moment, he remained silent, but then, with stubborn defiance, he slowly raised his head and declared, it doesn't matter if I'm divorced or fired. I'm going to be with Lily. What did you say? Everyone was shocked as my husband openly revealed his plans to marry another woman right after our divorce. He then confidently declared, I am skilled enough to work at any company without a problem. My father's company is worthless. As long as I have Lily, that's all I need. 
I truly love her. Marrying her is all that matters to me. My in-laws were stunned by his words. Even after being pushed into a divorce, cut off by his family, and losing his job, my husband still remained defiant. But his arrogance was about to hit a wall. You might not know this, but Lily has been seeing several other men as well, I revealed. That's a lie. Lily loves only me. You're just jealous and making this up, he shouted back, refusing to believe it. But it's the truth. She has relationships with multiple men, and you weren't the most important to her. Not the most important. Yes, you weren't that significant to her. In fact, she paid the compensation to me quickly to avoid any problems. I can't believe it. I didn't think Lily was that kind of woman. The idea that she had feelings for you was just a delusion. You were being used. By the way, the compensation she paid me was actually funded by another man she was seeing. That's a lie. There's no way Lily would deceive me. We are going to get married. Nothing you do can stop us. My husband still couldn't accept the truth, so I calmly confronted him with the reality. It's time for you to understand that you've been abandoned. Haven't you noticed that you haven't been able to reach Lily lately? Your calls and messages aren't going through, right? Now that I mentioned it, my husband hesitated. He started to realize what was happening. In short, you are no longer needed. You've been blocked. I am no longer needed. Yes, exactly. Do you understand now? There's nothing left for you. This is what happens when you deceive others. After hearing this, he collapsed to his knees and bowed his head. Please, Amy, I'm truly sorry. Please forgive me, he pleaded. It seemed he finally realized his situation. Please reconsider the divorce. Please reverse the firing, he begged, bowing repeatedly to me and his parents. But everyone had already moved away from him. It's too late for apologies now. I will demand a fair division of our property and the money you wasted using my credit card. A person like you is just a nuisance to any organization. If you think you can work somewhere else, go ahead and try it will be worthless. Please don't leave me like this. I'm reflecting on my actions. Can I have just one more chance? He continued, his voice filled with tears. He appealed to his father, but my former father-in-law, having given up on his son, ignored him and hurried out of the restaurant. His wife followed, and the relatives also began to leave, showing no further interest in my husband. Well, I'll settle the payment then, I said. What? You're paying the $20,000? He asked in disbelief. Of course, I'll bill it later, I replied with a sweet smile. He muttered something as he collapsed onto his knees. Today, because of my retaliation, became the most painful day for him. However, this story is not yet over. His ordeal will continue. After the incident, I returned to my parents' house. But for the past few days, I've been receiving numerous missed calls, all of them from my ex-husband, James. The phone is still ringing nonstop, and I know exactly why. I had been ignoring his calls on purpose, but this time, I decided to answer to deliver the final blow. Amy, you finally answered. Please help me, I'm really in trouble, James pleaded. It sounds like a tough situation. What happened? Are you trying to escape debt collectors? I asked calmly. What? How did you know that? Did someone tell you? He replied, shocked. No, I found out on my own. James, you've racked up a lot of debt, haven't you? Not only were you giving money to your mistress, but I also heard you've been paying your co-workers to do your job. Despite their refusals, you forced them by using your position as the boss's son. You used underhanded tactics to keep up appearances at the company, enjoying affairs in your free time, and took on debt just to live how you wanted. Such foolish actions. On the day the family gathered at the fancy restaurant, when it was discovered that the credit card had been cancelled, James had no choice but to pay the $20,000 himself. But I knew he couldn't do it, I had already found out about his significant debt. James, this is all the result of your own actions. But you're capable, aren't you? Leaving your father's company shouldn't be a problem, right? Well, 
The truth is, I haven't found another job yet. All my interviews have been unsuccessful, and I'm being chased by debt collectors. It's wearing me down mentally, he confessed. That's exactly what I expected from someone who pushed their work onto others to make themselves look good. Even if you find another job, it won't last. Don't you get that? My words hit him hard, and he couldn't respond. Unless he reflects on his actions and changes his ways, he'll keep making the same mistakes over and over. If things continue like this, he'll only face more misery, even without my intervention. Amy, I truly regret everything. I should have valued you more and worked sincerely at my father's company. But I neglected all that. I'm genuinely sorry. Won't you consider starting over with me? He begged. I must say, it's impossible to try again. I believe people can change, but some actions are unforgivable. You didn't just deceive me. You deceived many others who trusted you. You need to pay the price for that. And of course, you will fully repay the property division and the money you misused. Escaping is not an option. After hearing the silence on the other end, I calmly ended the call. Ten days later, I heard more about James's recent situation from my former in-laws. As expected, he hadn't found a stable job and ended up asking his family for support. I need help because we're family. Is it okay for your son to end up like this? He pleaded desperately. It was frustrating to see him ignore and deceive his family and relatives, only to turn to them for help when he was in trouble. His self-centered behavior is something I've always noticed. James has lived comfortably because of the help and support from those around him, but I've never heard him express any gratitude. If I had seen his true nature before getting married, I would have never gone through with it. I deeply regret enduring everything alone, without asking anyone for advice. If I had reached out to my in-laws or other relatives sooner, maybe my future would have turned out differently. From now on, I'll be more honest with myself, aiming to become stronger and more determined. It's time to say goodbye to the weaker version of myself and step forward with a firm resolve into a new beginning.